我在长江上，在长江上航行，那么我更喜欢长江了。本身长江就是我们中国就是做母亲河了，当然我更喜欢了。这个变化挺大，原来的话这个航道的话很窄、很弯，水也很坏。现在的话这个修水以后的话，这个航道条件改善了，大大的改善。现在江面也变宽了，水又变缓。Technology versus nature. China is trying to shift away from being a coal-burning society into using hydropower, a more efficient, cleaner source of energy. I'm right now in Chengdu with Yang Xin, photographer, environmentalist. Yang Xi has taken over 50,000 photographs of the Yangtze River, and he's turned it into an environmental cause here in China. I've talked to many environmentalists on this trip, and I seem to get a common theme that China needs to progress, but at what point is this going to become a problem? China's environment has already been a problem for five years, ten years later. For example, like the river Jiangxi, 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 最在长江最发达的地区所造成的水环境的污染，可能是最严重的。你比如说，现在每年长江排入长江的，就是这种污水污染的水，是两百八十亿吨，就这个数量。你在这儿的话，看到你在长江上游，在四川，你还能看到几条清澈的河流。但一旦你走向长江的下游、中下游地区，你几乎。看不到一条清澈的河流。长江呢是亚洲的最长一条河流，在这个一百八十万平方公里里面，生活了四亿人口。而且中国的话，还有一个工程，就是因为中国北方比较缺水，还准备把长江的水拿一部分到北方去。这样的话，长江算起来，它大概要养活七亿人口。One of the things that makes the Three Gorges Dam project so controversial is that over a million people have been removed. We're in the historic town of Fengdu, or what I should say is left of it. For the rubble you see was once a city, but it's now all been torn down. These towns scatter the Yangtze River. Old towns being replaced with new ones. But talking to people, what I've learned is that New people, the younger people, are actually not so against the Three Gorges project. They're looking forward to living in modern cities. It's the old people who are losing their way in their culture that are concerned. We're now entering Lock One of the Three Gorges Dam. Three Gorges Dam is a modern-day version of the Great Wall of China. Built with over 40,000 employees, it is the largest project since the Great Wall of China. And to many, this Three Gorges Dam is a symbol of China's re-emergence as a world power. What can you say, but I'm in awe? What a technological marvel. We're in Shenlong Stream, a tributary to the Yangtze. An interesting point that the captain told me was that before the Three Gorges Dam, all of this beauty was inaccessible. But because of the dam, this water rose from one meter to 40 meters, allowing people to come up here and enjoy all this beauty. These are some of the gentlemen who've been moved from their old rural farms to the new cities that you've seen. Hopefully, when we take a pause, I'll be able to ask them about how they feel about the move. How do you feel about the move from the old place to the new homes? This is the 
对，基本上都那个没有服，都那那那个了，是不是？喜欢我的新房子，旧房子也留呢。这是我们老辈子给我们留下来的，但是在现在新房子比过去的房子好得多，舒服得多。这些河床现在都看不到了，但现水实际上好处来说呢，现在的好处多。但是在我们这一代人还是留恋这些的，在小小学的他没有见到这个和尚，他就不留恋了。Are there any drawbacks to the move? 有些呢，搬迁了过后他有钱，可以做生意，啊，可以能够维持生活。有些能力差的，年老了的，他这个维持生活高度就差差距要大一些，他就没有土地，没有那么多的土地来维持生活，这有一。因为部分人来说，还是有这一点缺陷。The sturgeon here, a hundred and forty million year old species, almost went extinct. To the Chinese, what the panda is to the woods, they are to the sea. So they're very sacred. One of the drawbacks of the Three Gorges Dam project has been just the environmental protection of animals. The migratory path of the sturgeon's been cut off. The sturgeon can no longer come in from the ocean and go up the Yangtze to reproduce, so the Chinese government is trying to artificially inseminate the sturgeon and bring back the population. The sturgeon is genetically modified. This is not natural reproduction. So how this will affect it, we don't know. How they react out at sea is another big issue. The results are still to be determined. Is the government doing a good job in handling the environmental situation? Yes or no? Good, but not enough. Yes. Not good. I think we should not answer the question so simple. Uh, our country is a developing country. Uh, uh, our economic, econ economic is, uh, is developing. We must uh, at one hand develop our economic. On the other hand, we should uh, solve the environmental problem. Um, so there are many problems now, but our uh, government is trying their best to, do, um, to solve the problem. Orcas are beautiful creatures. An orca is actually not even a whale. It is a dolphin. In fact, it is the largest species of dolphin that exists on the planet. A resident orca pod is a family-based group. The orcas live together from the day they're born to the day they will pass. One of the things that I found really fascinating about the resident orca pod is that when the season is over, they leave their homes, but none of the scientists know where they go. We're going to meet two scientists, Dr. Paul Spong and Ken Balcom, two individuals whose lives have been dedicated to the betterment of marine life, in particular orcas, two individuals whose styles are completely different. We've just arrived at Fort Hardy, where we're going to meet Dr. Paul Spong and learn about the northern resident orca pods. In this community, which is, occupies the central coast of British Columbia, there are about 230 members. It's called the Northern Resident Community. They occupy a, a pretty big ocean space, thousands of uh, square kilometers of space. There's a huge abundance of food in this space, and yet the population is small. These guys have been here in these local waters for about 10,000 years, probably, like since the last ice age. He is one of many scientists responsible for putting a halt to taking orcas from the wild and preventing them from being shipped to marine parks. He doesn't believe that people should be interacting up close, in boats, with the orcas, but that we should respect their territory and observe and record them by land-based observation only. The Orca Life Project is very interesting. I uh, use technology to connect uh, people with nature. The technology needs some development before it reaches sort of the optimal capability. Basically what we're trying to do is connect people to nature in real time. Using uh, the remote camera and the internet, we're able to show people what happens. And so we have um, 
sort of a choice of six different cameras. His specialty is linguistics. So off the coast of Hanson Island, he's placed microphones throughout the bay. He studies the way orcas communicate through clicks and squeaks and how they use sound waves, known as echolocation, to find fish. Strangely enough, what we're doing now is very similar to what we were doing when we first came to Hanson Island. Our objective was to find a place on the shore that we could watch whales from and put a hydrophone in the water and listen to their sounds. And that's pretty much exactly what we're doing now. How many hydrophones do you have in the water now? Uh, there's six of them up and down Johnson Strait, uh, about 50 square kilometers. Orcas are the most powerful predator in the ocean. They have extraordinary physical power. And they literally have the ability to do anything they want to do physically to any, anything else in the ocean, including themselves. And it seems fairly obvious that a long time ago they reached the conclusion that the use of physical force isn't that constructive or effective in terms of managing a society. Orcas live very long lives. The females uh, have uh, opportunities to certainly have many more offspring than they actually do have. So one wonders you know, about whether the fact that there's a low population is something that just happened or whether there's some intent associated with it. We're now leaving Hanson Island and returning to the United States where we'll visit the Southern Orca resident pod. Dr. Ken Balcom is a scientist who is known for discovering that the Navy sonar might be responsible for beaching the whales. His background is in the Navy. I want to welcome you to the Center for Whale Research. Today we're going to explore the life of the southern resident killer whales of San Juan Island. I was a whale biologist before I went into the Navy, and then what the Navy did was uh, immerse me and acquaint me with underwater sound. They put a hydrophone in the water and we're getting a little underwater sound. If, if they're out here chatting, we should hear them. They're out there lobtailing, splashing, breaching, carrying on, way more active than the northerns. When I was 12, I read this book called Circus Doctor. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to do something with wild animals. Went down to the whaling stations and I thought, now there's a species that needs some study. Our main mission is to document the status of the population. In this case, killer whales. We've done blue whales, fin whales, humpbacks, and beaked whales. Document. What's the facts? How many are there? And then let the public and the government know. We started a center for whale research. Every year we have uh, college students or young people volunteer to be staff. A lot of them want to be paid, and we tell them, unfortunately, that's not the case, but you can be fed, and you can camp in the yard, and you can meet all these other wonderful people, and you can help study these amazing whales. If I had the money, I'd endow it so that there would always be funding available to have it go beyond my lifetime. Okay, so this is where we keep our Earthwatch teams. This is their house. In the summer, oh, probably 20% of the mornings I wake up and the whales are right off that point coming this way. If you look for about 10 minutes, you give them a time to come to the surface. They're, they spend sometimes seven or eight minutes underwater. In the 60s, the aquariums learned that they could catch and keep these animals in a tank. And they were huge attractions for all the marine parks. And a big industry started in this area, catching them and selling them all over the world. Most of them died within a year or two, but it seemed like there was an unlimited supply. They just kept catching and selling. And uh, by the time that stopped in 1976, there were only 68 left. You can feel his connection, his passion to protect what he believes to be the most sacred creatures on this planet. Dr. Ken Balcom has created a system of recognizing his orcas. He does it by classifying their dorsal fins. Each orca has a unique marking. Take a high resolution picture of the dorsal fin and saddle patch, the gray area. The female generally has a lower fin about two feet tall and it's recurved or triangular. Whereas the male's fin grows to about six feet and is uh, usually triangular or even 
leans forward. There's three main pods in this area, J, K, and L. There's 24 in J right now, 21 in K, and 44 or 45 in L, depending on who's still alive. We've had three new babies this year. But there is none more famous than J1, also known as Ruffles. J pod, it's our most resonant pod in the Puget Sound area. J1 is the, the patriarch, so to speak. Actually, for a while, he was the only adult male in the whole population. It says here that there's a female that's estimated to be born in 1911. Right, we estimate she's the mother of J1 because she's traveling like moms do. They say J2 and J1 are always together, and that is the way mothers and their sons and daughters travel, is always together. A bonding that is also functional. All the babies help herd the fish. See, they have to herd fish. It's useful to do that with animals that you know very well, that you've lived with all your life. You know, each knows what the other's going to do in a certain situation. Well, the new babies are born at about uh, 400 pounds, 350, 400, and eight feet long. And the largest in here is J1. He's uh, probably 26 feet and uh, 16,000 pounds. He's probably 55. He would eat probably uh, 240 pounds of salmon each day. We've been doing this 30 years, and he was one of the most recognizable whales when we started. And he's just gotten even more majestic and recognizable as time goes on. That little stream of water coming off the tip of his fin. Well, the way that you uh, eventually get to know them best and, and time your photography, if nothing else, is by holding your breath as long as they do. And, you know, just sort of getting a sense of their rhythm. I seem to be stuck in a rut of trying to photo identify everybody all the time, but sometimes it's nice just to put the camera down and, and just be there. Here we meet this tour guide, and he takes us into the uh, slave fort to give us a tour. And it starts with going to the dungeon underground, and it's really dark and dank and mildewy, and you can almost hear the crashing of the waves. You go into this room, and it has no ventilation, and they would put about two to 300 Africans in it and just shut the doors and lock it. And then there'd be an observation room from up top, so if they wanted to feed them, they would kind of come and throw scraps down. We went to the room where the women would go, which was on the other side of the fort. And it was the same conditions. And then finally, they take us to what they call the door of no return, which is this big wooden door. People were taken, put on boats, set to sea, and never to return again. In Los Angeles County, there are 1,100 gangs, 86,000 gang members. More than 600 of those gangs would be Latino. How do you do it? Somebody has to do prevention, keep kids from joining gangs and engage them and somehow keep them connected to loving, caring adults who pay attention. Hey, kiddo, are you working? Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery. Kids are going to drift and misery loves company. I've never met a hopeful kid who joined a gang, never, ever, not once. Kids who can't really conjure up an image of tomorrow move closer and closer to joining a gang. And kids don't seek anything when they join a gang. They, they flee something. You know, he can't say that both his parents were heroin addicts and, and been long dead. 
that guy can't say that. You know, my mom used to put cigarettes out on me when I was a kid. Or that kid's going to have a hard time saying that his mom used to hold his head in the toilet and flush until he nearly drowned as a way to punish him. In 92, we started Homeboy Industries by way of Homeboy Bakery because we wanted to create jobs because people weren't hiring these guys. Then each thing was an evolution, you know. As we would progress, we'd discover things. We'd say, boy, there are a lot of tattoos. They really want them off. Nobody's hiring them. This, I'll go over it a, a, with a little bit less strength because it's already scarring. I think oh. you're trying to take it away, right? Yeah, I burned it out. Yeah. So we started tattoo removal. We removed 1,200 tattoos last year. Uh, we have 400 treatments a month. We have 1,600 on the waiting list. This is... Roscoe, yeah, right. how many right. treatments have you, he just got out of prison, what just prison one. did you just get out of? Sentinella. Sentinella. This what? place is a touchstone, it's a place where they can come and connect with that sense of resilience. You want to get them to a place where they feel confident in who they are, because when they leave this place, the world's going to throw stuff at them that's going to knock them for a loop. I'm 27 years old. I was born in Boyle Heights, Aliso Village Projects. I've been doing drugs and gangbanging since I was a, a really young kid. Like some people ask me, you know, well, how was it before you, try to remember the guy before you started gangbanging and using drugs and stuff. And when I think back that far, I'm like on roller skates, you know? <laughs> We'd come down here and ride all over the walls and get into the river on inner tubes and float down the river. It's a little deep, you know, it starts way back. I mean, some of these kids out here don't even know what they're fighting for anymore, you know what I mean? You start to see how hard it is for people to navigate these waters here, given that enormous gang reality. I came here as a priest in 1984. We had eight gangs at that time at war with each other. I buried my first kid in 1988. I buried my 141st a week ago. I lived through a decade of death in this community from 88 to 98. In 1992 we had a thousand gang-related homicides in LA County. Well we had 500 last year. That's still horrific, but that's still progress. I was shot in both legs. Once when I was 14, I was shot right there. It went in and out with a nine millimeter. When I turned 15, a year later, I got shot once here with a 38 special. I think I was just lucky. <laughs> yeah, because he let off the whole clip, but he only hit me once. I think this person that was once a criminal, gangbanger, whatever it was, can change into a productive member of society, man. You know, people change. I feel like Homeboy Industries is my calling. You know, I love to do what I'm, I do, and I love to reach out to these kids, you know, because they're all we got. You know, and I don't want these kids going through what I went through. I believe in giving people chances, and I think that's exactly what Father Boyle does. He gives people chances. Second chances, third chances, fourth chances, you know, whatever it takes. Forever. I'll never turn you away. You want to communicate always a no matter whatness. No matter what you do, the day won't ever come when I withdraw love or support or help from you. That day won't ever come.